Um, yeah, I will take you to Germany in the 16th century today and to the uh, surgeon's workshops. And as we are talking about boundaries between academic and non-academic medicine, and thus also about where such boundaries ran, how they could be crossed and also dissolved. Precisely because we are taking an international perspective today, I would like to start my topic with a basic piece of information that not everyone may be familiar with. In the German speaking area of the early modern period, which I will be talking about, the activities of academic physicians and surgical practitioners were strictly separated by the guild laws of the cities. Physicians had to limit themselves to drug treatment, any, external treatment of the body as well as operations and dressings, but also therapeutic interventions such as bloodletting and cupping were sole prerogative of surgeons. If a healer of one of these two groups interfered with the other sphere of treatment, they would usually follow a lawsuit. To understand this very strict separation, one has to go back to the time of urban health organization before the presence of academic doctors. I will briefly introduce the city of Lübeck in Northern Germany as an example. Here in the middle of the 15th century, the barber surgeons had joined together to form a brotherhood whose statutes laid down the rights and duties of its members. They were obliged to accompany the city's mercenaries to war as well as the city's envoys on their travels abroad. The highest position among the so-called magistri or masters was held by the Ratsarzt, the council surgeon, who exclusively treated the city authorities and gave expert opinions in court cases on the context of poor relief. He deliberately was not chosen from among the local surgeons, but was appointed by the council and the guild as a stranger to the city on the grounds of a widespread reputation. So one can see how closely the city authorities and the surgeon's guild were linked here as the essential actors in an already thoroughly regulated urban healthcare system. Masters and council members also held the master examinations together. A master certificate certified by the guild and the council was the prerequisite for being allowed to practice the profession throughout the Holy Roman Empire. Now, imagine what happened when gradually and also due to the confessional division of the empire, more and more universities were founded, from which more and more academic doctors emerged, who appeared in more and more towns and cities, where they encountered what was actually already a regulated, established healthcare system. What we observe is that in the course of the 16th century, the position in these healthcare systems that were close to the authorities and were held by barber surgeons before were very quickly filled by academic doctors, the town physicians. I have argued elsewhere that sources from the town archives indicate that this did not happen because academic medicine was thought to be superior in any way to craft medicine. It was not academic medical knowledge, but academic writing skills that made physicians interesting professionals to the authorities in terms of managing the growing bureaucracy of the healthcare system. They could write letters in a flowery yet academic style, develop forms, write argumentative reports. Now it was them rather than the barber surgeons who exercised control as experts and were thus superior to the surgeons, not only in terms of social status, but also with regard to the hierarchy of the healthcare system. Physicians sat in on surgeons' examinations. Physicians strived to regulate the surgeons' prescriptions of drugs. Physicians considered surgeons as executors of their therapeutic instructions in the surgical field. And with this picture in mind, let us now build a bridge to the academic subject that Fabrizio will also talk, talk about later, to anatomy. Many medical students from German speaking countries went on a study trip to Northern Italy, Southern France, and later on also to the Netherlands 
in order to experience something that was rare or non-existent in German universities, not only bedside teaching, but also anatomical dissections and practical surgical training. In the sources from the 16th and 17th centuries, we can find many complaints that students leave this or that university because there are no dissections taking place, or at most once in a year. Surgical instruction was limited to theory. It discussed the origin pathology of diseases that were to be treated surgically and the medication that was to accompany the surgical treatment. This is due to what I've already explained. German physicians were restricted to drug treatment. Now the question one must ask is, against this background, and of what use is the study of anatomy or even practical surgery for German medical students with regard to their later work? University medicine derived physiological theories from anatomical studies. But anatomical demonstration taught little about the pathology of the humors which physicians were supposed to treat. One is inclined to say, studying anatomy may have been an academic ritual in the context of medical studies and served as an affirmation of the understanding of the body as taught. But at least in early modern times, advanced anatomical knowledge seems completely useless for the later professional life of physicians practicing in Germany's towns and cities. And surgical skills, even more so. The group of healers for whom this knowledge would have been useful was a different one, the barber surgeons. And they seemed indeed to have been interested. The increasing number of medical writings in the German speaking world since the beginning of printing contrasts with a smaller but also steadily growing number of surgical publications. While the medical ones are written in Latin, the surgical ones use the German language. Especially in the 16th century, it's quite clear that in these prints, practitioners write for practitioners. In response to academic publication, and I think to defend their own expert status as well, they strive to provide a systematic picture of their own knowledge. These writings expect their readers to be fully trained surgeons. They are to be understood as a means of advanced training in one's own profession. And anatomy is an important part of that training. I would now like to show you this with illustrations from books written by surgeons. Previous research has mostly focused on printed texts, but when dealing with surgeons, one must keep in mind that in the barber surgeon workshops and guilds, there also existed written knowledge, which was only exchanged within one's own profession and according to personal agreement but which was not supposed to reach the public in print. Those writings included, for example, the Practica Copiosa by the surgeon Kaspar Strohmeyer from Lindau, who specialized in herniotomy and eye surgery. Strohmeyer dedicated this richly illustrated manuscript to his colleague, the surgeon Peter Hafner from Zürich with a strict condition of secrecy, as you see here. He gave it to him in exchange for a manuscript he had received from Hafner's father. In his text, Strohmeyer explains not only every single step of the operation, but also every item needed for herniotomy, from thimbles to knives and needles to bandages, with the help of self-drawn and annotated pictures. He also, depicts the table on which they are lying all the instruments whose handling must be known. This image is strongly reminiscent of Vesal's instrument table, which the German speaking readership had become familiar with eight years earlier when the barber surgeon Jakob Baumann commissioned a German translation. The reception of Vesal becomes even clearer in the part of the script dealing with the operation of the eyes. Here, the representation of the brain are copied as found in Vesal, but designed for workshop use. For Strohmeyer and his colleagues, 
anatomy had no value as a book that sat separately on the shelf as it did in physicians' libraries, but its content had to be integrated into practice manuals. You had to know the connection of the eyes with the brain if you wanted to cut them. A second example is the Kunstbuch, the book of artisanship, written by the lithotomist Georg Bartisch in 1575. This is a manuscript too. Bartisch, like Strohmeyer, explains his instruments in detail and at the same time formulates his concerns that this knowledge had better not be published for everyone. His anatomical drawings concern the body regions that were particularly important for lithotomy. In particular, we see the bladder depicted as a folding picture illustrating the layering of the organ structures, both for men and women. So you can see how anatomical knowledge circulates outside the walls of the university and is received with a view to its usefulness for everyday practice. I find it an interesting question how this content finds its way into the surgeon's workshops. We know, of course, when anatomical or surgical works appeared in print, including those in German translation. But we can only rarely prove that people owned or knew about them, Strohmeyer being a rare exception. I do not assume that in everyday life, physicians and surgeons were hostile and did not speak to each other. Our sources paint a distorted picture of the willingness of the professions to conflict but we will probably never find a transcript of a conversation in which the physician and the surgeon sit together in the evening in a pub, the surgeon saying, you know, I had a really interesting case today. He had this or that on his leg and I cut like this. And the physician saying, yes, that's really very interesting. And by the way, we call that where you cut into it, musculus femoris. And there's a really interesting structure underneath. I saw that at the dissection back in Padua, let me tell you. That may have been the case, but we don't know. However, there is a situation in which the physician, the surgeon, and their respective anatomical knowledge meet, and Georg Bartisch himself provides us with a picture of it in his manuscript. This is how his book starts. The scene depicted is quite obviously not an operation scene. It is a post-mortem dissection in which the bladder containing the stone is emphasized as a pathological structure. Such post-mortem dissections after death, either by violence or disease, were performed jointly by physician and surgeon. The surgeon, as the expert, wielded the knife. The physician, responsible for the paperwork, wrote the report. You surely know the Germans love administration and forms. Here we have an early example of a form and how a finished report should look like. It is found in a treatise on the assessment of fatal wounds by the Leipzig town physician and professor of anatomy and surgery, Gottfried Welsch. Welsch states that there are two skills needed to perform a post-mortem dissection. Namely, thorough anatomical knowledge and the ability to cut on the dead body. The distinction between body and corpse here marks the boundary between the competence of the physician and that of the surgeon. On the dead body, German physicians, if they had the skill, which seldom was the case, would have been allowed to cut because this was not a surgical treatment. The ideal physician, according to Welsh, should have these two abilities, on the one hand to instruct the ignorant surgeon, on the other hand to take over the knife himself, if necessary. This seems to confirm the picture of the surgeon that research has been so fond of drawing for a long time, ignorant, unskilled, to be educated and guided by the academically trained physician. But then we also read the physician, in Germany, now usually has a surgeon at his side, explicitly not, as many doctors probably believe, as a mere sidekick who gets his hands dirty for him, but to listen to the surgeon opinion about the findings as well. 
So the postmortem dissection is a place where anatomy was practiced and discussed outside the university. I think this could also have been the occasion where many a surgeon got the idea of wanting to study anatomy at the university. This would have enabled him after completing his studies in addition to his master title to prepare such reports completely on his own. He himself living up to the ideal to cut and to write and to take up a leading position in the urban healthcare system with a simultaneous qualification to practice as both a physician and a surgeon. And this is what actually happened. For the last two years, I've been studying a movement that began as early as the 16th century and expanded in the 17th. Sons from surgeon families who first took their surgical exams in their guild association, then studied medicine. Interestingly, one repeatedly finds that they studied the artists at German universities. Here, they learned the writing skills. For their medical studies, however, they mostly went to Northern Italy and Southern France, and here almost exclusively to Padua and Montpellier, where they refined their cutting skills and studied anatomy with the surgical eye. Unlike their purely academic fellow students, this brought them advantages in their hometowns. This migration of knowledge out of the university and into areas of urban life, which had not previously been dominated by academic content, not only created incentives for broader academization, it also had a broader impact on healthcare in the whole Roman Empire. The surgeon sons returned from their studies and took a new look at their previous spheres of activity. To wrap up my presentation, I would finally like to introduce Tobias Geiger, another surgeon, as an example of this development. He was born in 1575, trained as a barber surgeon with his father, served as a field surgeon in various campaigns and eventually became a master. He then practiced in his hometown. Five years after opening his workshop, he began to learn Latin privately. Finally, parallel to his professional life, he pursued medical education at a nearby university, which brought him to a clear judgment regarding the quality of craft education on the one hand and academic studies on the other, at least in Germany. He then drew up a clear roadmap for the next generation for his sons, and he submitted this plan to his prince as a model educational concept. Ideal healers of the futures should first attend Latin school and then be trained by their fathers as barber surgeons. They should go with them to the hospitals to help treat patients, as he had his sons do. After that, they should begin to study. He had his son study the artists in Ingolstadt, but then he did not send them there to study medicine as well, because in his opinion, this could not have taught them anything, desolate as the situation at German universities was. Instead, he financed their study trip to Leuven, Padua, and Montpellier. Both finally took a double degree in medicine and surgery in Padua. Regarding the hospital in which Geiger worked, he developed its potential in his concept. In near future, son of surgeons should be able to acquire basic practical knowledge of anatomy, botany, and pharmacology there, even before beginning their medical education so that the hospital could thus also function as a training center following the Italian model. The further development of anatomical knowledge would have a special place in this kind of hospital. One could perform dissections on all those who died in the hospital instead of working as it was done at the universities with corpses of executed persons who had not been ill. Led by a trained surgeon's interest, not only in physical structures, but also changes, Geiger thus proposes a concept of pathological anatomy as it was to enter German hospitals, not before the end of the 18th century. To come to a conclusion, when university established anatomy as a part of medical education in the 16th century, they somewhat unintentionally 
built a door into the walls of the university that opened not only to release physicians with newly acquired knowledge into the world. Very soon, trained experts from that world outside were knocking on that door, bringing with them their specific knowledge and ambitions. At least for the German speaking world, it looks as if anatomy of all things as a topic seemingly remote from practice had in fact contributed a great deal to setting non-university developments in motion and thus to expanding the boundaries of university medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you.